these guys survived the David Kahn era of Timberwolves basketball and live to tell about it. It's Flagrant Howls. Now, this this is an exclusive right here. This is Jim Peterson. By the way, Kyle Tige back on Flagrant Howls after a few days off. Uh, Jim Peterson is literally in the parking lot at the airport having landed from Denver earlier today. This is on the ground reporting here, folks, from Jim P. <laughs> hey, man, I'm dedicated. Well, first of all, you know, I apologize. You know, sometimes the NBA schedule gets pretty hectic and travels taking me away from being able to be on. Um, my golf game prevented me one time and then poor, you know, poor Kyle. You know, the time when we were in uh, Utah and I'm driving through Zion and <laughs> Kyle had to do the, the show by himself. So, hey, you know, what? sorry, Kyle, you know, if you really would have told me you would have to do it by yourself, I could have found a, you know, in and, you know, in, in Zion somewhere to stop and done it with you. I'm a no, I'm appreciative for real that you just make time to do this. You're doing it from your car today. We haven't connected in a while. I know I've texted you a couple of times, but uh. I know you were on the call again last night. I was blacked out again, so I had to watch ESPN, Jim, so I didn't get to hear you and Grady do it. But uh, I had multiple people. I think Britt Robson led the charge on this that they thought last night was maybe the best game you've called all season. So I don't know if you want to take it from there, Phil, because I'm sure you got to listen to that one. But uh, I thought it was – is he it saying me, is he saying me and Grady or me in particular? I don't know. What's, what's Britt saying? I think, he, I think he said that, like, something about you and we're just lucky that – it was a gem to have you guys call in that game last night. I'll find the real text. But I will just say I'm not anti bigger organizations, but it was a it was a tough listen last night with Bob Myers. So if anyone that was watching the ESPN stream, oh wow, it was a little more difficult last night. There was a lot of sentences that didn't exactly equate to someone who has watched this team. So I don't know. Any way you want to take it, Phil, but I thought last night was one of the better basketball games, despite the result being kind of lame. Yeah, what was the, I mean, just, you were there last night, Jim, and the fourth quarter kind of went sideways, but I don't know, like, these two teams are so fun to watch play each other in the chess match. What did you observe? What, what do you, now that these teams have played each other four times and going back to the playoff series last year, what was your takeaway from the arena last night? Well, it definitely was a, you know, it was a heavyweight fight. I said it was Hearns Hagler from the 80s, I and mean, it was like a lot of haymakers were being thrown both ways, and <laughs> Um, you know, I just had this conversation with Tim Connolly on the plane. Uh, Grady and I sit in the very back of the plane by the restroom. So you know what that means. Everybody's got to come through us. We're the <laughs> gatekeepers. Um, and you know, and for the most part, we just, you know, we just get, Grady and I do our thing, you know, and we let people come and go. Cause like, who wants to sit there and like have a conversation when you're going to the bathroom. But um, anyway, but I did stop Tim cause we were talking about Jokic and Grady and I were talking about this last night and I, you know, it's like, I just think that when you see Nikola Jokic in person, it's different than on TV. On TV, it's dominant. But when you see how big he is and you see how he ragdolls people all the time, and I'm saying like big guys too, he ragdolls big guys. And what did he have? Like five and ones last night where he, he made shots through contact. Um, and I, I made the statement to Grady last night. I said, you know, watching Shaq and Kobe back in the early 2000s and how dominant Shaq was and how big of a human being he was, um, and, and how dominant he was physically, I feel like Nikola Jokic is like is is even better than Shaquille O'Neal just because of all the different ways that he can beat you on the basketball court. He can beat you in post up opportunities. He can beat you up, you know, off the dribble. He can bring the ball up the court, and initiate offense. He can play in the high quad like the two man game between he and and, and Jamal Murray is just the, the the options they have out of it. And then like it's just as a passer, how he can dice you up. I just think that Nikola Jokic is going to be – he's going to be a top-10 player all time. Um, and that, I don't know how you guys feel about that, but I feel like he's every bit as dominant, if not more dominant. And Tim agreed with me. Like he, I think he's got a little bias, and he said he does. But I think I think that Nikola Jokic is more dominant than Shaquille O'Neal. I love I that. I love that, dude. That's, that's, a, a, that is, that's an informed take by someone who played, and I didn't. But I – Watching him is as much as you don't like to watch him because he's an opponent of your favorite team or whatever. He's so good. Uh, he is just incredible. It seems like he always makes the right play. I think he gets a pretty good whistle. There was that moment where our, even if Rudy sold it last night, I felt like Jokic knocked Rudy to the ground going for that 50-50 ball. Yeah. Jokic got yeah. another end one. But uh, speaking of that game, because I did see one clip, and I again, this week, you played Jim. I didn't. Jim, do guys have to dribble anymore? Because Aaron Gordon, Aaron Gordon just gets to put the ball down every six seconds. 
Like you well, guys that's what I was. Dribble? I was saying I was getting so irritated during the game because Aaron Gordon's bringing the ball up the floor and he's completely yo-yoing it, and he's he's like he's discontinuing his dribble. He's 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 turning it over in his hand, and I'm saying like, are, are yeah, I mean, are are these guys going to be letter of the law? That 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 the non-call on Jokic, you know, strong arming Rudy and knocking him to the ground. I think there was a little bit of, uh, you know, method acting with Rudy right there. But I think there was, there was a real part of it where he really got knocked to the ground and that kind of changed the game because Wolves were up three at that point. Um, and Jokic, you know, gets an and one opportunity out of it. And then, you know, um, uh, they hit a lucky three, uh, after that. Um, it was just like, and it went from like a, you know, Wolves up three to down 10, you know, in the fourth quarter, it happened in about a three minute span. So that was a momentum play. And, and I didn't think that Bruce, uh, that brothers had a Tony brothers had a good game last night. I thought that referee and crew was a little bit uneven. So I, I, I loved your, at one point you made a comment and this not, not to make this all about officiating, but, uh, but like Jokic does get a great whistle and he also goes hunting for the whistle and, but then anytime the wind blows a little bit against him on a call, he is the most incredulous. And oh. I think I think you used the word like the audacity that he has <laughs> right now in this moment after what's happened the last five minutes yeah. to even look at the official like, dude, wow. <laughs> yeah, it's you know, it, it is it is pretty his, it's his way. But um, no, I, I really do think that he's going to be and you know, the thing about it is kind of like uh, playing golf with my son, Sanjay. You know, I put a golf club in Sanjay's hand when he was four. So Sandy is a plus two right now. So he's really good, but he could care less about playing golf. And when I play with him and he shoots 72 and he hasn't played in a year, it just makes me so mad. And the same thing is true with Jokic. This is what Tim and I were laughing about is like Jokic be a t- could be a top 10 player. And I, I don't think he could give two craps about whether he is or isn't, you know, he just I mean? wants to go home. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He just wants to be alone and he wants to go ride his uh, harness horses or whatever he does in, in Serbia. But, um, no, I, I, you know, the thing I was saying, um, last we, we, Grady and I were talking about this too. Like if I know that, uh, NBA Twitter is all, um, aghast about, uh, the Timberwolves right now that they think that Minnesota was outclassed by Denver, but anybody that says that didn't watch the other three games, um, because the wolves completely dismantled Denver in the first game at target center early in the season. And then when Denver came to target center and Minnesota was completely depleted, they lost by three, but the Wolves could have won that game really easily, and they didn't have Rudy, Cat, or Nas in that game. And I think that scared Denver a little bit. And then the Wolves go to Denver March 29th and dismantle them again. So mm-hmm. if you're saying that the Wolves don't belong in the same class as Denver, you didn't see the other three games. Amen. So I have a whole list, Jim, of just questions I wanted to ask you since we haven't talked in a couple of days. But another thing that came up this week, you were on the call Tuesday night when Ant – has a 50 point game 51 to be exact and i saw alan horton tweet out the list of guys that have had 50 point games in timberwolves history and you tweeted at him we've seen them all so i don't (laughs) just take that anywhere you want but like what has it been like or you know that night in specific they needed all 51 from ant to pull that game out but how cool is it for you being long term with this organization to have seen all those different guys drop 50 at some point well, and you know what's what's funny about it too is that Carl is the top of the list. You know, Carl yeah. has the sixty point games. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. um, so I don't think Cat gets enough credit. A lot of the a lot of the lists, you know, before Cat uh, came to the Timberwolves, um, three point shooting lists, you know, mm-hmm. all time scoring lists, any kind of like metric that you want to say, like the team history, they were sad lists. Um, and even like the coaching, you know, list is pretty sad too, because we were talking about how fast Finchie has been, you know, vaulted into uh, the number two spot all time wins list. It's uh, the the coaching history with this team is kind of sad too. Um, I still maintain Chris Finch is the greatest coach in Timberwolves history. Um, Carl Anthony Towns has, has gotten up there along with Kevin Love and with Carl Anthony or with uh, Kevin Garnett in terms of being an all time great Timberwolves player. But Anthony Edwards is going to rewrite everything. Like the, I just, I just hope he spends his entire career. I hope he's like Kobe Bryant and, you know, uh, you know Larry Bird, Magic Johnson to play with one team. I want him to be in that category because I think that he is. I, is there a more joyful player in the NBA that that you've seen? I, I just don't know if I've seen anybody 
since Magic Johnson that has that kind of charisma and the way that he's yeah. able to engage with the crowd and the way that the, the camera loves him too. The camera loves him. Um, the, the photograph um, of uh, of him holding up the the the, the 50 and um, I don't know if you noticed the the finger splint that he had on his hand. Oh yeah. 21. Um, uh, he had the 21 on it. And so I don't mean to hijack this podcast, but um No, hijack away. I, I cried when I saw that photo. That was don't no, say it, don't say it. don't say hijack at an airport though. We're looking out for you. <laughs> Be careful. Well, so anyway, I just was talking, I was texting with longtime equipment manager Clayton Wilson because you know KG wore that finger splint his entire career. I don't know if you guys remember that or not, but if mm -hmm, you take mm -hmm. if you look at photographs of Kevin Garnett from 1996 to the time he retired uh in a timberwolves uniform he had that splint on his finger and he would he would oftentimes dunk it would come off of his oh, finger on oh, a dunk he'd go, off, yeah. he, he was like why is he always bending over after a dunk and picking something up it was the the finger thing uh, it was it was the splint coming off his hand so he cut his finger hmm. in a game in los angeles um against the lakers and it was in 1996 so he cut his finger. He actually needed the splint, but then he played great with the splint on. So the splint never went away. We know how superstitious KG is. Yeah. Um, but there's a story that I re was remembering, and I was trying to remember some of the particulars. So I was texting with Clayton Wilson after I saw Ant do the 50. And so I said, Clayton, what was the story about KG and Memphis? And so the year that the Timberwolves were uh, trying to vie for the number one seed in the Western Conference in 03 04. They had to play Memphis the last game of the year, and it was the Pau Gasol Memphis Grizzlies too. So it was at the Pyramid. It was it wasn't at uh, you know FedEx Forum. It was at the Pyramid, which is now a Bass Pro Shop, by the way. <laughs> um, I don't know if you guys know that or not. You guys got to go look that up. Look up the Bass Pro Shop in Memphis. It was it's where the Grizzlies first played when they moved from. Vancouver. By the way, si side street down a side street. Have you guys seen? A rash of Bass Pro Shops trucker hats all over the yes, place. Yes, I see them all over. I Why was are people just wearing Bass Pro Shops hats now? What is that? I have Kyle some. has one. I have a couple. <laughs> um, they're back in the closet. Uh, I think they were like mass produced and like really cheap. I think they're selling them at like Walmart and stuff. But they are. Yeah, as trucker hats become more popular or whatever, and you can see I got one on. Uh, yeah, they are. They are all the rage right now. I think for the next generation. But back to the back to so, the end of the 2004s. So, so, yeah. so I'm texting with Clayton, and so. Anyways, so KG um, had to have the splint on. He he virtually could not play without the splint on his finger. And so when they go on this road trip, um, KG forgot to put his splint in his shoe. And then Clayton would put the shoes in the bag. And, and you know, the equipment managers, they handle all the equipment. So um, when KG found out he didn't have a splint, Clayton had to send an uh, intern into the Timberwolves locker room back at Target Center, get the splint, bring it to the airport, have a pilot that was flying a commercial flight from Minneapolis to Memphis take the splint to the Memphis airport. A courier had to go pick it up at the airport and bring it directly to the pyramid so KG can play in game 82 that the Timberwolves won to be the number one seed in the Western Conference in 0304. That's an amazing story. <laughs> That's crazy. What a wow, cool job. Dude. So, wow. so I mean, so KG was just so superstitious. And then, you know, I don't know, did you see KG's tweet at Ant about – about yep. that the, the splint i mean so yeah. anyway i i told i say that to say i, I just was telling lee i was telling grady last night the story because i'm still filling grady in on timberwolves history things that happen yeah. and the importance of it so i was telling him last night and so i was telling leah that this morning on the plane so she's going to try to track down to see why and because i don't i didn't ask anybody why ant had that 21 on his finger i just i just thought it was cool that kg tweeted at ant with that picture in mind so Man, it is yeah. like, I, I and I know there's all, and we're probably not going to talk ownership on this podcast, but there's like these, this, the KG force and the Anthony Edwards force. I think we all want it to come together more closely and hopefully it does at some point, but it is so cool to see him from a distance on Twitter. He's clearly connecting with this team. He clearly still communicates with Carl Anthony Towns and, and Ant. It's, um, I hope, I hope he comes to a playoff game. I hope he comes to a playoff game. I'm not sure if he's quite there yet, and it's kind of a mess right now. But, man, I like those guys together, Anthony Edwards and Kevin Garnett, bridging the 35-year history of this franchise. We need it to happen at some point. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Um, you know, I just was um, 
Grady does a, a thing and, and you know, I, I, I need to promote this more because, you know, all these wonderful people that work in the Timberwolves organization, um, that all these videographers that they have, and they take all these incredible behind the scenes videos that you see on, on social media, but they do um, a 15 minute uh, YouTube piece. I don't know if you guys ever watch it or not. It's called tracking the pack or whatever. And Grady yeah. does the voiceover stuff. That's some beautiful video that they shoot. And we were just watching and I, 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 it's not really on my radar for whatever reason, but it is now um, the, the video from that road trip uh, from Indiana through Utah um, and all the incredible plays and, the, and the, the camera angles that they had from behind the scenes. Like you have to watch this video. Like Anthony Edwards is, is just such a beautiful human being, man. Like, and, and like you get to really see, like when you see track the pack, you get to really see some behind the scenes stuff that you don't get to see normally. So I would I would say people go watch Track the Pack on Timber on the Timberwolves YouTube feed and see some of that video. Grady does a great job of narrating that stuff. And between him narrating and his awesome calls, it's 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 great video. It's great, it's great viewing. So yeah, it's on YouTube and they do it yeah. at least once a month. I mean, they turn yeah. it around now pretty fast, which is hard because it's hard to edit that stuff. But they did a cool one when the team went to Dubai or Abu Dhabi, like yeah. in the preseason. So if you don't watch Track the Pack yet, do it, but also to your point, Jim, Grady does like the narration and it's the more, I mean, if Michael Grady just wants to leave me voicemails, like the more I can listen to him, the better. So uh, go check that out. Yeah, I I, I'm sincerely thinking about having him do my, I, I've never done this before. Cause um, I have two things on my phone. I, you know, I, I, I've never done an outgoing uh, uh, thing on my phone for people to leave a message. Oh yeah. Um, but so my ringtone is still Alan Horton's call. Um, Oh, that's oh, that's a foul. Um, the, the Kevin Love thing. That's my ringtone. When you call me, Ed Malloy. <laughs> Ed Malloy. Ed Malloy. Yeah, if you were to call me right now, Kyle, call me right now. I'm like, <laughs> All right. Yeah, I'm working on this right now because that. So that's anytime anyone calls you. Uh huh. Oh my god. Okay, this is just on the fly. I'm By calling. By the way, Alan Horton and Ed Malloy had never met each other, and maybe still haven't until this season. Here we go. David Guthrie is right there. You never got to call. Also, go in the line. <laughs> <laughs> it's Let's my ringtone. <laughs> That's the greatest moment of my podcasting life. <laughs> wow. Okay. Well, Wait, good so luck. you I'm ever just like s- sitting at a restaurant, you leave your phone on on accident. Yep. And and, and all of a sudden, people people are looking over. <laughs> what's funny is when someone calls me and i'm sitting on the plane with alan horton he's like he's kind of over it now at this point but that's that's so good i was saying too because back to you said something you said it before jim that like it would be awesome if ant had kind of a kobe career i don't know if you saw this phil but last night was ant's 300th game yeah for the timberwolves and i just thought it was crazy to look at those i mean he was he's first in points through 300 games in franchise history eighth in rebounds fourth in assists third in steals and then mm. first in three pointers made. Um, it's crazy to think that what we're only what in year four and he's mm-hmm. already played 300 games. I mean, I was looking back cause I was looking at some LaMelo stuff. Everyone from that draft class, a lot of those guys haven't played a lot. Wiseman, LaMelo injuries, Patrick Williams, Ants played like 96% of every season. Uh, and it's just been, it's crazy how far he's come, right, Jim? I mean, you've called every game. It's crazy to see how far he's come in four years and to think that he's still probably four years away from his prime. Yeah, I, and I think that, you know, having Chris Finch and this coaching staff and Chris Hines, um, the, the, the way that Ant gives credit to other people, um, his maturity, his um, old soul mentality, the fact that he's able to share the, the spotlight, he's so pumped that, you know, that cat's coming back. I mean, it's like the, um, the post-game interview after the Washington game with Leah you know, it was so great because, you know, he was saying cats coming back. And then also, um, Down you know, the line. Uh, uh, yeah, how excited he was about do I, am you going to have energy for tomorrow night in Denver. And he, and he just was like, hell yeah. You know, he's like, he's so, yeah. he's so real, you know? Um, so yeah. So, you know, he's, he's improved so much even this year, like his playmaking has gotten so much better as his, his, his off ball awareness has gotten better. Um, it's not, it still has ways to go yet, but, um, still, um, it just, the, he's a supercomputer, you know, he's, yeah. he, he's learning exponentially. He's like AI, you know, he's just getting smarter and smarter all the time. And it's just fun to watch. You know, you mentioned 
like 10 minutes ago that you asked the question sort of rhetorically, is there any player in the league that just is more joyful than Anthony Edwards? And I don't know that I can name one, but the thing I love about him, not only is he maybe the most joyful player, but he can flip that switch to killer mode, like basketball killer mode, whenever he needs to, where it's time to go get six points in 30 seconds and tie this thing up or it's time to get a clamp stop on defense and he so he can kind of toggle between being this conductor of an arena this joyous personality and also i'm going to take this game and reach into your basketball soul and rip your heart out the kind of that that kobe uh you know mamba type mindset too he's got both and he has the ability to talk smack, and he could talk smack effectively to humiliate you, and he can talk smack to you and make you laugh. And yeah. and he can also, um, when something is going against him, he can also appreciate it too. I don't know. It, it was a small thing last night, but when Christian Brown was uh, doing demolition at the end of the game and he was getting all those dunks, he dunked left-handed on Rudy. He had the lob dunk. Like he was just like a, it was a dunk fest, right? There was a um, – came out of a timeout. And it was Ant and Christian Brown standing next to each other, and and they were talking. And Ant was, I think, really kind of like enjoying the moment with Christian Brown. Do you guys remember that? I mean, it was. Mm -hmm. I don't know if ESPN had that feed, Kyle, but it was on our feed. We just had the video of them standing side by side and Ant chatting with them, and they're laughing. You know what I mean? So he also has a good nature part of it. He's a he's not a sore loser. You know what I mean? He could stand next to Christian Brown and en enjoy the moment with him that he had a great moment himself. You know. Yeah. So the next time we hear you call a game tomorrow night, uh, Wolves Hawks, you, there's something else you said. Cronley Towns might be back. Uh, we're not sure yet, but how do you? There's been a lot of questions or conversations, you know, on podcasts and articles about integrating him back in. What are your kind of thoughts on that, just in general, and how important do you think, like, kind of like I think that you got to have all players available. You know what I mean? Like this team can't do what it wants to do without integrating Carl back into the mix. Well, I think that Finchie's, you know, Finchie's command of the English language. Um, I, I just think that so many people enjoy his post-game pressers, right? Because they're yep. so listenable. He's so real. And the the, the words that he chooses to use, I, I think that, um, you know, Dane and Britt have brought this up too. I think Britt, who was also a wordsmith, I think he enjoys listening to Finch so much because I think they're, they're fellow travelers yeah. when it comes to that kind of thing. And Finch has used the term... Well, I like the original term he used with Cat, and that's stray voltage. I mean, that was just like you know, so classic, and and so descriptive, and so precise and right on. Like everybody just goes, "That's exactly what it is." It's stray voltage. Yeah. But he also he also said this about Cat too: is that one thing you miss with Carl Anthony Towns, you miss his on-demand scoring. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's another phrase that I think is really true. Like his on-demand scoring, like Cat can score in bunches, just like Ant can, and so. I think that's one thing that he's going to bring back to the table is ability to score in so many different areas of the floor. And then I just hope that he's learned something about playing with a 0.5 mentality. Like just having watched how, how the way Nas plays is a lubricant to the offense and helps things playing in the flow. And that Ant is even – Ant still gets sticky fingers. Um, and and But how many times have we heard since Cat went down that the offense isn't flowing because the ball's getting sticky? Mm -hmm. yeah. We haven't really heard that much, right? And so I'm hoping that that's the one thing that Carl picked up that he really learned, like how important it is for him to have a .5 mentality that he can't sit there and as the ball goes from – swings through him in the middle of the floor – that it doesn't stick in the middle and he's jab stepping and pump faking and or playing off the catch trying to you know steamroll three three defenders that are taking away his drives that he he learns to be more of a playmaker and have a 0.5 mentality if he does that he'll be integrated back quickly yeah one of the i just pulled up the quotes from this is from a couple nights ago finch asked about i think dane asked this question uh, about how seamless he feels like it's going to be to reintegrate cat and to what you just said the the word smithing here is excellent so finch said quote obviously cat is extremely talented we need him to be a very good version of himself but also i think there are some things that we've figured out in the last couple of weeks that we're going to need him to kind of lean into as well it might be slightly different than the rhythm in which we were playing before he left so you know and Gobert said some similar things that, hey, he's super talented. We love him. 
we have figured some things out over here. We need him to lean into those things as opposed to maybe pulling toward sticky fingers or whatever it may be. And I don't know, man, like if if they can seamlessly integrate Cat back in in a way that gives them a nine man rotation of awesome players that they didn't have access to in last year's playoffs, I think they can get to the finals. And I don't know if that's a hot take, but if Cat is in and it's not clunky, man. This team can do some damage. No, the Western Conference is loaded, you guys. But, yeah. uh, but if Cat can come back and you can play at the level that you're capable of, I don't think anyone's beating this team in the West in a seven game series. That's my hot take. I, I think, think Jim. We, I, I, I think, think Jim froze. Otherwise, he just is inundated <laughs> by that take that you just gave. Uh, I'm with you though too. I mean, I think a lot of it is Phil. A lot of people now are focused on seeding. Right. And what mm-hmm. what seed will the Wolves be? I don't really care because when you do look up and down those standings, I don't know, like there's just every team you can make a case for being a good matchup or a bad matchup. It's more about these next two games are actually kind of important now. Agreed. You want to integrate cap back in. I would expect him probably to play tomorrow night against Atlanta. But finding a rhythm for this, again, kind of modified new rotation again when you throw Carl back in it so you just want to be playing really good basketball obviously you want to you know knock on wood you want to avoid any injuries but uh yeah Jim we're just talking about getting Carl back in the mix yeah. and and I said finals if Carl integrates back in and they elevate I think they I think they can get to the finals that's my hot take well I said it at the beginning of the year I mean I don't know if you guys remember but I I said this team can get to the finals um I, I knew this go. I mean, I kind of felt this way going into it, uh, into the season. I felt like this was the most talented team in Timberwolves history. I mean, the team in 03, 04, I mean, the bench was, was not spectacular. I was never a big, you know, um, Michael Olawa candy fan. I mean, I speaking of sticky, by the way, I mean, like <laughs> that guy ever pass out of the post. My God, I mean, he was a true black hole, man. Like that was, um, it was, I don't know that we, we just have a better team now. I think this this roster is is balanced. We have shooting. I think it's gotten better. Even you know bringing in Monte, um, I think that he, that Monte um, has all that experience. I so yeah. I think this team can get to the finals. I think that it can get past Denver. Um, I think that Boston is a team that we match up okay with. I just I just think we have so many great perimeter defenders, and we have the ultimate rim protector. Um, we have we have enough offense. Um, we have the coaching staff. We have the guys that can X and O it, and and I think that we've got a competitive flair and a veteran group. So, I'm with you, big time. I'm with you, Phil. I Jim, think that we we'll do it. Jim, you said one thing that I want to follow up on about the Nuggets, but the Wolves have played the Nuggets really well all season long. You know, they've won a couple, yep. lost a couple, whatever. The one team, and again, I haven't talked to you in about a week, but the one team that the Wolves just have never really had an answer for, despite a small sample size is the Phoenix Suns. When you see that matchup, potential matchup come playoff time, do you see any major red flags there? Or is it just once again, being able to bring that defense that has been top defense pretty much all year and finding ways to just execute in the fourth? Yeah. I mean, who does, who does Carl guard? Yeah, I know. Yeah. Well, who does Mike guard? You know, if you got if you got Beal and you got Booker and you got Durant out there and they've got Grayson Allen out there and uh, I just um, who I mean like so we can we can have some matchup issues like I didn't think Mike was great on Beal like yeah you know, it ended up being okay because really what Beal did at the beginning of the game like was all that he really did in the rest of the game but right Durant I mean Durant and Booker we can match up with them we've got I think you know between Jaden and Ant I mean we can we can guard those guys but who who do the other guys guard that's that's right. some of the question so um I know I, I think that during a, um, a seven game series I think the Wolves will figure it out I think I think mm-hmm. they'll be able to match up with them because Phoenix is way more inconsistent I mean they've been a, a super big time volatile stock all year long and I think that you don't change who you are come playoff time yeah Throw your if you have a Denver thing, Kyle. No, I, I, just, I was I was just trying to think of you know as that's the talk right now is these next two games figuring out are you going to be the one seed, the two seed, the three seed. Everything is changing up by the minute. Uh, I just don't really think about it. I'm just with Jim on his original take in October that if this team plays the style of basketball they can, they integrate Carl back in. I'm not worried about the opponent. It's just play your best basketball. 
grind them to death and then hit shots in the fourth and you're going to win. You've been a good team all year. Like, why would I all of a sudden be scared of the Suns who had 22 points in the first half against the Clippers? The other night? <laughs> it's yeah, they, And they've also been weird in the fourth quarter all year. The Suns, the too. Team, yeah, in the fourth. Yeah. Actually, you know, just we started this podcast and we'll, one more thing here, Jim Pete, and we'll let you go home after this road trip. You're <laughs> sitting at in the parking lot at Signature. Um, we, you you mentioned at the beginning of the podcast that in the back of the plane on the way home, you uh, you talked to Tim Connolly for a little bit. And that is one guy that I'd love to ask, man, you sat there, Tim, you took this job, you made a blockbuster trade. Everybody clowned you for it. Although this podcast was very pro, at least I was, Kyle needed a little <laughs> bit of convincing. Okay. But this podcast was very Rudy Gobert trade uh, friendly from the get go. But Tim Connolly spent, 12 months, 15 months hearing from NBA talking heads, people in the league, fans saying that's the dumbest trade in the history of the NBA. That's the Herschel Walker trade. And so I'm wondering, as he's sitting there in his office for 12 months, 15 months, knowing this is a good trade, why is it not manifesting? This is a good trade. Like, we need to stick with this, run the roster back. I wonder what he was thinking then, and I wonder what he's thinking now, that this team, they're not going to get the one seed, but like, 57 wins potentially what must be going through his head after all this two years yeah i meant to ask him that actually because um um i just was talking with some people about his his um reason for because he knows that denver roster so well he knows nicole Jokic and what he is and i'm i'm just wondering how much he made that trade for rudy gobert to be able to beat the denver nuggets and nicole Jokic. Like, you know, that's like, cause that's the guy, cause everybody was trying to figure out a way how to beat the Lakers and Shaq and Kobe, right? You had to have some dominant bigs that could deal with Shaq and you had to have somebody that could guard Kobe and you could score enough points. And teams have done this throughout NBA history is that there are certain people you have to contend with and you got to have people on your roster that can, that can deal with them, that can overcome their greatness. And so Nicole Jokic is one of those guys and Rudy Gobert has been one of those players, you know? So um, and, you know, I was on uh, the um, NBA radio yesterday with Antonio Daniels, and he posed the question to me. He said, what would you rather have? Would you have rather have positional um, versatility defensively or would you rather have great rim protection? Hmm. And, and so, I mean, my answer to him was that in today's NBA with like with all the three point shooting and all the great perimeter skills, like I think that having our the, the perimeter defenders that we have right now, we have the ability to contend. Like, I don't think that Kyrie and, and Luca who, and that's another question they asked me too. Do I think that's the greatest, most skilled backcourt in the history of the NBA? And I think that, that when, when you think about Luca and you think about Kyrie, the fact that we have Jaden and Ant and Nikhil and Mike and all, and Kyle and all these great defenders, like Kyle's done a great job on Luca, right? Yeah. How many times, have we seen Kyle take the ball from Luka Doncic end of game situation for Minnesota to win the, the two pit bulls, you know, Ant and Jaden, like, like they don't scare me. So perimeter versatility is what I ended up choosing. But after seeing Rudy Gobert up close, Kyle and Phil, what he brings to the table defensively, we would not be where we're at without Rudy Gobert. Do you guys agree? Yeah, I agree. And also Rudy kind of gives you like he's like the Venn diagram. He gives you both. I think of that possession where he guarded LaMelo on a switch for like all 24 seconds to force a really bad shot. I mean, Rudy can that's not ideal. You want him at the rim, but he can get out on the perimeter and guard some guys, too. So I would I would lean what you said. But I think the Wolves, the reason they're so good, Phil and Jim, is because they have both. I mean, they have like you said, they have the perimeter defenders and they have the rim protection. And it's a uh, I'm a defense guy now. I'd rather watch a good defense than a good offense. Yeah, but that's, I just think, I just think that Utah had limitations because all sure. they had was Rudy and all those terrible yeah. perimeter defenders. You know, yes. they they were limit they were limited in how far they could go come playoff time when you need to get stops because really at the end of the day, perimeter defense wins the day. Perimeter yep. you if you can't keep guys out of the paint, you know if you can't defend one on one and contest and get out and guard three point shooters, you're going to lose. So. Mm -hmm. You really do need both, but if I need one over the other, I'd rather have a bunch of pit bulls on the perimeter. Yeah, yeah. that's know? the thing. Like this, you're going to hear this in the next two weeks too. That Rudy Gobert gets played off the court in the postseason. 
Well, yeah, when like when you're running Joe Ingles out at you know <laughs> on the perimeter, not to slander Joe Ingles and Donovan Mitchell, you know, it's it's different. You and, and you bring up, for instance, the Mavericks, and I would put the Clippers in this bin too because the Wolves played the Clippers four times this year, and the Clippers averaged under 100 points per game offensively in those four matchups. So if they run into, there's a couple teams like that that you'd look and say, wow, there's Hall of Famers, there's Paul George, but you can throw guys at those players if you're the Timberwolves. When Remember that, was it last year against the Mavericks at the end of one of those games? And the Mavericks had like 20 seconds left to get a shot off, and they couldn't get a shot off against Anthony Edwards and Jaden McDaniels. Because you, you can just, you can throw dudes at some of those players. I don't know if you can throw anyone at Zion, for instance, if you match up with the Pel. There's a couple matchups that scare me, and the Pelicans are actually one of them. So we'll see how that plays out. But man, this is gonna this is gonna be the, so much. The, fun. the best play last night was I got to go listen now to Jim and Grady's call. But when uh, 24 seconds of defense, Gobert gets the block on Jokic, right? Ant throws it ahead to Nas, who throws it to Jaden, who goes behind his behind back. Behind the to back. Oh. Uh, oh. That was defense leading to offense. But that was basketball porn 101. I mean, that was oh. if you don't like that. Well, and the, the, the other the other one too, because I was watching on uh, on Twitter today a replay, the ESPN's replay of Ant going up for a jumper. He was going to get his shot blocked, so he throws it back to Nas, and yeah. Nas takes it, takes it, and <laughs> saves it by going between his legs, yeah. and then did this incredible spin dribble. And then ended up getting an and one opportunity, and like the ESPN guys just like did not phase them at all. I mean, talk about uh, basketball porn. I mean, like that to me, like the skill up. Wrong Grady, button. Grady made a farm noise. There we go. When that happened, Grady and you both <laughs> were like, "That was incredible in the moment." And one Nas lands on the ground. That was a. Uh, it was a good game oh. last night. Again, bad result, but to have a chance to get to fifty-seven wins and to clinch this two seed. Who knows? Who knows if the one or two seeds better until you actually play each other? But uh, it's been a hell of a season, and I know I speak for Phil and a lot of people, Jim. Uh, it's been awesome to have you on, and hopefully we can keep this going through the playoffs. So yeah. thank you, sir. As yeah, always. you guys got it, man. Great, great to be. I yeah, you know, I, I I would only do this for so many people, but you people, you two people are two people that I would do this for. So oh, well, well, thank you. It's a great man. compliment. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Guys you sir. Sir. Okay. Enjoy your time yeah. in the uh, airport parking lot, and we'll talk to you next week. <laughs> There he is, Jim Peterson, Jim Pete Hoops on Twitter, if you want to follow him. And uh, we'll get to a random Wolf of the Week here shortly to close out this show, Kyle, after we shout out our friends over at Nicolay Law, the official personal injury law firm of Score North, Flagrant Howells in this case. So Nicolay Law is proud to serve the Twin Cities community. They're very local. They're just your normal, everyday folks that happen to have law degrees to help you when an unexpected accident occurs, you can give them a call at one 855 nicolay or nicolaylaw.com is their website. Get Minnesota's local award-winning injury lawyers. Get Nicolay. Also, our friends at First Equity Mortgage are helping to power this show on a weekly basis. And I had a great experience a few years ago with David over at First Equity refinancing my home at the time. 24 years in the market. First Equity is Minnesota-based. They pride themselves on on being ingrained in the community. In fact, David is a 20-year uh, Wolves and Lynx season ticket holder, so you see him roaming around Target Center. They also offer programs for veterans and for new home buyers if you qualify. First Equity Mortgage, femort.com. That's femort.com or scornorth.com. Keyword, David. Let's bring him in. Producer extraordinaire, Ross Brendel, with the Random Wolf of the Week. I think Ross is muted right now. He is a broadcast professional, <laughs> a professional I broadcaster. I have failed this podcast. <laughs> I am so sorry. It's good so to good see to you boys again. Yesterday. Good to have this back. My apologies. Like Tuesday, we're supposed to do a show. Had some stuff come up. Talk about it later. But uh, I'm glad to have you guys back. And also, I, I should have said this 40 minutes ago. But uh, because I said this last week, Phil and, and Ross, uh, my mom and dad made it safely back from Hawaii. They're resting comfortably back awesome. in the great state of North Dakota. So shout out to my mom and dad. But uh, life is back to normal a little bit uh, on the personal side. And now we're ramping up for what seems to be a fun and maybe dramatic and chaotic Timberwolves yes. playoff run. Uh, but we will have all that coverage here at your favorite lifestyle podcast. Fun, dramatic, and chaotic. What a great way to set up the return <laughs> of Random Wolf of the Week. 
<laughs> Which, uh, this is how it works. We'll explain this, and then Ross will throw out some clues. So it's a battle between me versus Kyle. Every single week, we try to do this weekly. We should probably play some catch-up and maybe do two next week. Uh, but Kyle has an 11-6 to six lead, including two consecutive wins with Stefan Marbury and Dante Cunningham as the last two random Wolves. Felipe Lopez, Corey Brewer, Andre Kirilenko, and J.R. Ryder before that. Ross will throw out some clues. Each one of us can shout out guesses whenever we think we know the answer. If one of us hits a third strike, the other one wins automatically. And, uh, yeah. By the way, for people wondering, like, Stefan Marbury, he's not random. You guys don't know ball. No, it's literally just random wolves, randomly generated wolves. And Ross has his own beep, burp, burp, burp algorithm. And we'll see who it is today. And sometimes the random wolf of the week algorithm returns somebody you might not know. Like literally you forgot they existed. Sometimes it returns a star player. You never know what you're going to get with random wolf of the week. And here we go. Gentlemen, this random wolf of the week is American born. Do we get heat, heat check guesses? You do. Yeah, Good luck with it, that first clue. Rip. These American do not born. count again, by the way. He, if you get it right, it counts. If you get it wrong, it does not count as a guess. Why would you do American born as a clue? That's a, is that a clue in itself that you would even think to say American born? Is there a question well, about whether he's Al Jefferson? That is not correct, Kyle. Just letting it rip. Uh, Will Avery. <laughs> Love me a good Will Avery reference. It is not Will Avery. Yeah, those guesses don't count to our three strikes. Those are heat check guesses. Clue number two, this random wolf of the week was a five-star recruit out of high school. Five-star recruit out of high school. That's I would venture stars. to guess most NBA players were five-star recruits, but not all of them. Yeah, it'd be tough to... Well, the, some of those Timberwolves rosters probably weren't rocking a lot of five-star high school recruits back in the <laughs> day. They probably had five total stars on the roster. Yeah. This a random wolf of the week, gentlemen, not a first round pick in the NBA draft. So a five star recruit out of high school. They were not a first round pick. This random wolf of the week made his NBA debut playing against the L.A. Lakers and scoring three points. Is it Nas Reed? It is Nas Reed. Well done. Whoa. Wow. Do you have what? his game log stored in your head? What? That's, uh, by the way, correction, that's six man of the year, Nas Reed to you. <laughs> what? Kings Re fans. Um, no, that WrestleMania was star Nas Reed, by the way. I mean, there's probably other guys that would fall under this filter, but five-star recruit coming out of high school, goes to LSU, terrible first year, comes out undrafted. So when you said five-star, but not a first-round pick, Got me thinking the way you word these things, my friend Ross, that maybe this guy wasn't even drafted. So you didn't even let me get to he was you know not what? even drafted in the second round. I was legitimately <laughs> set to guess Rick Rickert, but I couldn't remember if he play, if he played an actual regular season game or not. <laughs> That's a fun one. I'm glad timely too, Ross. Not Nas Reed. Everyone together, Nas Reed. And Nas two words, Nas Reed. And again, I'm not joking. That is completely random. And and this was actually it. When did we last think we were going to do Random Wolf of the Week? Oh two, three God. weeks ago? That's well, how old no, this one is. Oh, you, yeah. Well, Tuesday, oh, but you've had it prepped for like two yeah. weeks probably. Yeah, that's right. correct. That's on me. If you have time, I think we might. I do have a second one ready if you want to do a two for today since I got, Kyle I got mastered that one so wow. quick. Wow. Let's go. Okay. All right, here All we right. go. We're it's going a real on. heat this check. Bring it up. Another All right. chance to, it's, for Kyle to embarrass me here. Let's go. It's now 12 to 6. How about Nas Reed taking over WrestleMania, by the way? Good for Dude, him. that was amazing. Yeah, you had 75, I think it was night one, 75,000 people inside. Where were they? Where was WrestleMania? Philadelphia. Uh, the yeah. link. The link, right? I and can there was report. Just a gigantic Nas Reed towel in like the fifth row of WrestleMania. It's great. I can report. Now, granted, it was only about a 300 foot walk, but there was a Nas Reed towel at target field yesterday so okay it's taking over the world to keep going and i will say too back to the wrestlemania thing because at some point this podcast maybe in the summer we're just going to talk wrestling i was going back and forth with phil all weekend because phil really the wrestling historian ross he made a <laughs> perfect analogy of what happened at the main oh, event i, I mean, texted again, him to, to, i texted to, phil i told to, him bravo i i lol'd at this it was so well done to compare wrestlemania 
back to Minnesota sports. <laughs> Phil, I'm dead serious. I'm not blowing smoke. That was maybe some of your best work. I Good thought the Kansas, the Kansas City Tribal Chiefs was some brilliant. of my best work brilliant. on Twitter in 15 that's, years. Phil, that's what got me. That was brilliant. <laughs> All right, boys. Kyle now leads 12 to 6. Here's your second random wolf of the week for this podcast. Okay. This random wolf of the week is the definition of random wolf of the week. Do what you want with that clue. Oh, boy. Heat check time, boys. Hmm. Rick oh, Rick that's right. <laughs> <laughs> it is not Rick Rick. We need to confirm. Did he? Did he, he got punched out by KG in practice one time. I don't know if he ever played in the game. I, I his name. I think that was only exhibition in preseason. Rick Rickert was a one and done at the University of Minnesota. Oh, Lafonso Ellis. It is not Lafonso Ellis. I do have Lafonso oh. Ellis's autograph, though. I will get ripped in the comment. Rick Rickert, graduate of Duluth. And East, was named I think. 2000, yes, Duluth East, 2001 Mr. Basketball in Minnesota. So yeah. I am not aware of him, but he is a dude. Oh, dude. Uh, yeah, he played. A, he he was him and Prisbilla in separate years. Both were like one and done gopher players. Okay. The gophers had a great run of NBA big men, one and done. Chris Humphreys was a mm. one and done. Fun mm. fact. And again, thank you to Mr. Rick Rickert, who once bought me Chipotle. He was in front of me in line nice. at Chipotle. After his overseas career ended, and I said, ah, you must be Rick Rickard or something like that, and he bought my burrito bowl. He's like, you must be Ross Brendel. Let me buy you some lunch. <laughs> Kevin Garnett punched Rickard during a 2004 pickup game, leading to stitches yeah. and a chipped tooth, according to our friends at Wikipedia. Back to yep. you, Ross. Yep. <laughs> this random wolf of the week is six foot three inches tall and 200 pounds. Okay. But it's the, this... the, def- the definition of random, huh? This random wolf of the week, gentlemen, played in nearly 600 NBA games. Carry the one. Yeah. Over those 600 games, boys, this random wolf of the week played in only 34 games for the Minnesota Timberwolves. Oh, gosh. I got um, you right where I want you. The definition of random is getting me here. I'm going to control F. I don't think we've done this one. Is it Brandon Roy? It is not Brandon oh, Roy. Oh, you know. It is it. not Damn. Brandon Roy. Damn it. This random wolf of the week never played more than two seasons for any NBA team. Very random, very journeyman. This random wolf of the week was technically a part of nine different NBA franchises. Jeez. <laughs> That's wild. This random wolf of the week, this might help out Kyle, was the 11th overall pick of his NBA draft. No Kyle, year given, Kyle's but he was the 11th overall pick of his NBA draft. Dude was a lottery pick. This might start to get you guys closer. This random wolf of the week is a 2007 McDonald's All American. Martel Webster. No, he's it fourth is fourth overall. Fourth. It is not Martel Webster. You love Martel back. Webster as a guest. No, that was a good <laughs> guess, though. <clears throat> trying to be aggressive here. It's failing me. How about this? This random wolf of the week played college basketball at the University of Arizona. This is hard. (laughs) This random wolf of the week averaged 11 and a half points per game in his time playing for the Timberwolves. So he was a, he was kind of a guy. He kind of, he's, I would classify this player. I'll give you this. Even though he played for a lot of teams, this guy's career numbers are okay. He was he was fine. What, you he was a good he played, NBA player. He played at Arizona, or he came out. Played at Arizona. Arizona. Yep. Okay. Can I ask what was the clue before Arizona again? Was that the eleventh overall? Eleventh pick, yeah. Uh, and also two thousand and seven McDonald's All American. Oh yeah, the, the, yeah, that's right. While playing for the Wolves, this random Wolf of the Week wore number eight.
this player did not sign with the Minnesota Timberwolves, this random wolf of the week that is, he was acquired via trade in the month of November. Like what? In November? In November? In November. Per Sport Track, this random wolf of the week earned just over $48 million in his NBA career. Isn't that amazing? 600 games, nine different teams. I gotta do the just put a cool $50 million in your in your net worth. <laughs> the NBA, man. $80,000 a game. Is that the math? I think that's the math, yeah. <laughs> Prior to his trade to Minnesota... This random wolf of the week was a Philadelphia 76er. Oh, oh, oh Jared Bayless. God. Kyle for the win. Oh, nice he job, sweeps nice the job. day. Oh. He Best. sweeps he the 12, day. Like 11 and a half points per game with the Wolves. No, I wow. see. I, yeah, I didn't know that. I just, a November trade is always weird, right? Because that was the Jimmy Butler trade. That was the Jimmy Butler trade. Um, right? Yeah, it had to be. It was. Yep. I, I was going to yell out, Ross. Uh, I think Cole Aldrich. Was the eleventh pick in a draft? I'd have to go look that up, but obviously he didn't play Arizona. But um, okay, that was good one. Clue one, random. He was random. I don't think he liked <laughs> playing here either. So uh, Cole Aldrich was was he, the, was, he was a lottery pick, right? Eleventh overall pick. Yeah. Okay. Huh. Well, he was, also way, Martell Webster. I think was a top five pick. Wasn't he? I think so he Martel, was too. Yeah, Martell Webster had to have been a, a good by Portland, pick. correct? Yeah. Was he drafted by Portland? Yeah, he played for Portland. Yeah, he was a. Uh, Six I also overall, think, too, overall. if you're going to be traded to the Minnesota Timberwolves and it's early on in the season, I'm not trying to rip our fair state, but you get here in November and you just know it's overcast, cold, windy. You know, what a bad time yeah. to be traded to Minneapolis. <laughs> yeah, the fall, the fall leaves are probably <laughs> the beauty of fall has probably subsided. It's gone. Point, it's so. gone. It's just overcast and drizzly. Good job, Kyle. Um, Congratulations that makes, to Kyle. That was fun. That puts Thank you good. up. It's a. It's a football-like score, 13-6. to six. Phil needs a touchdown and an extra point to tie you at this point. Yeah, Kyle with four consecutive wins now in the random wolf of the week here. So I need to go back to the film study room, see what went wrong here, and study up on my 2016 Minnesota Timberwolves rosters, apparently. Good thing I had two ready. I, I wasn't – I figured you guys would get two words, Nas Reed, pretty quickly. Mm. I didn't know you would get them that quickly. So good work, Kyle. I am in awe. I'm not worthy. It felt good to just be back on the pod. So thanks again, seriously, to everyone who showed some love and support, but also to you guys for holding down the fort. We're back, and uh, let's close this thing out uh, all the way to June. All right, boys. Yeah, the Wolves playing basketball in June is something that's hard to compute, but it's possible. It's possible this season. This is a Timberwolves lifestyle podcast. Flagrant Howls.